Jumi sounds again. Let's see if today we can wrap up a series of the questions and conceptual refinements that are necessary if we're going to be able to use this term in a properly informed and I think precise way. The dilemma that we had arrived at the end of the last talk was the question of how does one prevent jouissance and the painful gratifications of jouissance from simply blossoming on and on in such a way that, to use that phrase, the revolution ends up eating its children. I'd suggested last time that for the French philosopher Alain Badiou, a reading of St. Paul and the life of St. Paul is one way of thinking about that. And I suggested furthermore that for him, St. Paul's idea that something like love, and let's not sentimentalize love as a kind of hallmark card love here. This is not necessarily that type of uh, happy, nice, feely, warm love, a kind of imaginarization of love. Love perhaps doesn't necessarily need to have those parameters. But back to the point that for him, St. Paul's idea of love and more precisely agape, Christian love, might help, might somehow be an antithetical to or a route around the prospect that jouissance can flourish into something akin to revolutionary hate. This, of course, might also point to my rather lame distinction between the Beatles and the Stones. Actually, I'm kind of, it's a colleague made this uh, quip at a talk that I did talking about jouissance, and he said, oh, it's just like uh, Badiou and Lacan, it's like the Beatles and the Stones. And I'm like, yeah? And he says, well, obviously the Rolling Stones, they're the guys who can't get satisfaction they can't get satisfaction for them they are the musical equivalent and the cultural equivalent of of jouissance of this excess this and can't get it so on so on and so forth whereas on the other hand we got the beatles who are all about love so yeah maybe it's lame but i think it helped makes the point but here's something that's not so lame you could argue and isn't this the famous jay javara quote let me say at the risk of sounding uh, problematic, I'm paraphrasing on the go here, that great revolutionary acts are guided by love. Isn't that interesting? It would then seem to suggest that even within that notion of what motivates a kind of revolutionary change, that jouissance, the satisfactions and excess satisfactions I may have from burning down the bourgeoisie, those threaten to consume me too, and they certainly threaten to, to uh, uh, derail the actual revolutionary impetus of that action. So at that point, I think we can start to say we've made it, that there is a risk that jouissance, even though it may motivate a beneficial change, we can get stuck, caught in a stasis of jouissance in the enjoyment of that, so to speak, enjoyment itself, rather than progressing onwards with a kind of revolutionary change. Now, I think it's important, we could say the same thing for the clinical domain. In the clinical domain, you could argue that it's very important to, at some level, facilitate or assist is too strong a word, but to facilitate the subject's engagement with their own results. And let's remember, of course, that there's a nice equation here or association that enjoyment, we've said earlier, isn't just enjoyment. It's also a mode of suffering. And that word enjoyment or jouissance in perhaps a more Freudian immediate direct reference seems to apply directly to one's symptoms. Now you can get where I'm going with this. You could say that many of us have psychological symptoms. Maybe we're obsessionals. Maybe we're hysterics in this language. Maybe we have certain symptoms, certain uh, nuclei of our suffering. But the challenge is, if we go to see the analyst or the clinician or the psychotherapist, implicitly underlining that transaction is the question is, you're suffering, you're complaining, you are, it's not, it's not good. What can we do to, to get rid of that? Well, we can talk about it, we can speak about it, we can, we can talk about it at great length. But exactly that same form of stasis can happen. I can start to enjoy my suffering. And in that moment, I become, I become stuck. And my suffering, the secondary gain or the primary gain even of that suffering is exactly what makes change impossible. So I've tried to note this down here. I've said on the board what to say about Dora. Now, 
often this, when people are talking about uh, jouissance and enjoyment in Freud's work, there is this reference to the Dora case. Now, of course, everybody knows the Dora case, or if you don't, here's the Dora case. Uh, a young woman comes to Freud, she's got some symptoms, but her situation is pretty awful. Her situation is that she is being pushed by her father into the arms of a man who's much older that she has no interest in. Dora's young, you can see this is in multiple ways problematic. Not only does the father want to push Dora into uh, an affair with a much older man who she's not interested in, the father wants to do this precisely as a screen uh, to protect and make it uh, and hide the fact that he's having an affair with her K, that man's wife. So Dora speaks to, to Freud about this. And let's say right from the outset, there's been an awful lot of feminist critique of Freud's handling of the case. Freud himself at some point admits that there's problems here. And so let's not, let's not say that Freud has been necessarily exemplary in his handling of the case. But nevertheless, we can make a point, even if that point sounds a little bit problematic. Freud's response to Dora, one among many, is essentially to ask something like, you're in a terrible situation. You've been pushed into the arms of a man to have an affair with that you don't want and your father's doing that. We've spent a lot of time talking about that and in some respects, perhaps you're right to complain about it. But what is your part in this situation? What is your role? Are you gaining some kind of secondary gain from this? Are you enjoying your suffering? Now, again, we can see in all the ways that that argument may sound very politically problematic. It sounds, in effect, like a kind of victim blaming. And I think that is important. But let's remember also that within the clinical domain, we also need to take a different ethical system into account. And that is to ask, not obviously directly, but to facilitate the asking of that question for someone who's in therapy, who's in analysis. What is your enjoyment? How are you stuck by your enjoyment? And how is your enjoyment impeding the prospect of some kind of change? Hence my note here, jouissance can be seen as inertia to change. The idea that we enjoy our symptom means that the enjoyable sufferings of our symptom are in some respects, perhaps most of the time, are preferable to actually having to change at all. So this idea that we enjoy our symptoms is an important one for clinical work. Early on in my own clinical experience, I had a situation where a woman came to speak to me and a whole series of awful events had happened in her life. And she was still living through the ramification of these things, which, let's say, weren't of her choosing and weren't of weren't her fault. But I think how I failed her as a, as a clinician is she, she was complaining about them, quite rightly so, and we spent session after session after session suffering, or she was suffering. And, and that's fair enough. That's fair enough. But I, I wasn't able at some point to try to do something that might enable her to move away from the suffering, the enjoyment in that suffering, into thinking about what might be a change. So it's a, it's a kind of challenge, both of the clinical process and of, of the political domain. How can one metabolize a jouissance and the investment in a certain jouissance, which gives stasis? How can we metabolize jouissance and enable some kind of change, some kind of uh, uh, transformation that exactly that investment in a type of suffering is holding back. So that is a kind of ethical way of thinking about some of these issues, a kind of ethical contribution to how we might speak about them. We're going to try and do just two quick pieces of conceptual work. I did mention last time this, uh, this complicated relationship between law and jouissance. One element that I should have introduced there is that the Frankfurt School has a, an idea. They call it de-repressive, sorry, repressive desublimation. Now, Slavoj Žižek has also kind of tried to utilize this concept and has done a certain piece of work with it. I'm not exactly sure how accurately Žižek develops Marcuse's idea, Herbert Marcuse, but for the purposes of this discussion, let's think about it in these terms. One way of understanding this notion of repressive desublimation is that you can have, in all Freudian terms, a kind of unholy alliance between the superego and the id. What might that look like? 
a, a, an unholy alliance between the superego and the id reminds me of a piece of PhD research that a, that a, um, a former student of mine was interested in embarking on in, a, in, in international relations. And uh, he was saying, what often happens in war is that rape becomes an element, uh, a systematic element of how war is, is carried out in certain parts of the world. And to me, that seemed to be the kind of example of what he, uh, this notion is, is gesturing to. Because if rape is an instrument of war, you can, as this soldier, both be, as it were, fulfilling your superego obligation to fight for your country, to do the right thing to fight for your country and all the noble ideals it is supposed to uh, represent. And yet, you can have id gratifications, rape, killing, murdering, as part of that. That kind of short circuit between id and superego is one way of thinking about this notion of repressive desublimation. And I think it's a useful way of approaching the question, not just of jouissance, which as we've seen is a way of extending, animating, of maintaining law, the spectral dimension of law is itself jouissance, but it also tells us something interesting about the superego. Superego for Lacan is a kind of a little bit different to how Freud wants to think about it. You might be able to see down here, I've described it in these terms. The superego is both the law and that which potentially destroys or undermines it. The superego is both the law, as is written, the ideals, all of those, and that which undermines it. So we have this idea then that, just as in the notion of repressive desublimation, that the superego benefits from enjoyment. The superego benefits from different types of jouissance. And so we get to this rather paradoxical moment in Lacan's work where he says the superego enjoys. And this kind of like, whoa. I'm used to thinking the superego in Freudian terms as a kind of bastion of social ideals, as, the, as a kind of conscience of sorts. Now you're telling me it enjoys? And I think there's a nice subtlety to the point at hand, because you could say then that in thinking about how enjoyment works, how jouissance works within certain social structures, you could say that it bonds subjects in at least two ways. How so? Well, it bonds them because there is a certain impulse to enjoy. And we've tried to explore in certain ways how enjoying together, enjoyment of the same substance, to put it in these terms, the same substance of jouissance can be a binding factor. However, it is also the case that if you're a kind of neurotic person like me, maybe you have that push to enjoyment. Maybe you do enjoy, but oh my goodness, that enjoyment comes almost immediately with guilt. And so not only then are we pushed, there's an injunction to enjoy ourselves, but once that enjoyment has happened, you could say that there's also the guilt that follows, the guilt that thereby reaffirms and bonds us to the social norms and laws that we've broken in the first place, which is a nice way of illustrating the idea that the superego is both the law and then that which destroys it. Or to put it again in those terms, the superego both is law and the, the, the compulsion, the, the insistence that one enjoys. The double bind of jouissance then is both that I want to enjoy, maybe that I do, but then that I suffer the enjoyment of guilt. Which is interesting because you may remember if you've listened to my lectures on dreams, I said, whose wish does the dream portray? You could now ask, who is enjoying in enjoyment? Well, presumably the embodied person who's doing the enjoyment is enjoying, but it's not just them. It's also, you could say, the superego enjoys. The superego enjoys the relentless punishment of the subject who's contravened a certain kind of law. Okay, so let's, uh, let's draw to a conclusion with that and we'll carry on and finish up. Sorry, we need one more lecture, both on the notion of fantasy and where I'll properly engage with the topic of hate. My concluding thought, which isn't really concluding, but it's kind of leading us to the next lecture, is a really interesting comment made by a colleague of mine, Sheldon George. Sheldon George makes this observation. Okay, and he's, he's, he's talking about, he's obviously talking about enjoyment. In the United States today, hatred is directed at rap music as a source of enjoyment. 
Rap music, in turn, is associated with African Americans. Contemporary discourses, contemporary discourse binds difference, not simply to the body, but to jouissance. I love this quote. It's really powerful because I think it's emblematic of one of the important contributions that the concept of jouissance makes to social theory and indeed to the understanding of racism. Let me explain. Normally, we have this notion of, well, where does otherness come from? Why is otherness, uh, how is otherness constructed? And one response is to say, well, there's factors of bodily difference and that exacerbates a sense of otherness and that also exacerbates and potentially leads to uh, ideas of cultural difference and modes of hate and so on and so forth. But what George is pointing to is that it's not just the fact of an apparent bodily difference. Rather, you could say that where the real pivot of hate is not simply bodily difference, but rather that it is an attribution of a certain kind of toxic enjoyment. It's the enjoyment of a something. This, this enjoyment of rap music, which itself is problematic. And that, an attribution of a certain kind of enjoyment, is what underlies hate, not simply a notion of bodily difference.